I'm trying to figure out through the idea of worship, as a matter of fact, because I, I say I kept using the metaphor of a North Star, right? Mm. And so what that is is what it's a it's a unifying direction. Yeah, it's you a, have it's to a like point for yourself. unifying to to aligning people's uh, focus or whatever. Yeah. And so worship, you know, can be individual, but it can also be this communal project. And in some sense, it's almost like what we're talking about by worship is getting people to put their to fixate their their gaze in the same direction and to be humble in the same way before the same thing, uh, rather than pointing in all different directions and doing whatever. Uh, and, if, you know, there's probably many intelligent things we could throw in here about kind of the Marxist perversion of this uh, exact system as well. Uh, yeah. you know, where but it's, marks. It's, what's important to understand is that in the system, because we talked about different infinites, it's important to understand that this this is a fractal thing. And that's right. what one of the differences between the, the authoritarian and totalitarian uh, gesture that we see in the 20th century and now again, is that it's fractal. So we we exist as a family by all being oriented together towards our unity as a family, right? That's right, our right, little right. North Star. And then we exist as a city to by having all our orientation in the same direction, recognizing the name, the city, and the structures which which embody it. So you have this fractal orienting that you that you mentioned, and mm-hmm. that that fractal orienting kind of they all these these orientations build up on each other and then create a world in which you can actually live. In the in the authoritarian system, they understand that too, but they want one thing that binds us all like one they want one an end point. they want a point like they want the state or they want stalin or they want the the leader or they want one thing and that in order for that to, to work they have to break down all the intermediary structures they have to destroy community they have to destroy churches they have to destroy all the intermediary points of attention in order to create one single thing that kind of tries to bind all of reality together. That's the Tower of Babel image as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think that you're not wrong in this. You're not wrong in this um, intuition that you have, that this fractal structure as you're you're framing it. I'm picturing like the Serpinski Triangle as you're talking, uh, actually, as a matter of fact. Is Is that the triangle with triangles inside? Yeah, yeah, it's the triangle with the triangle inside, the triangles inside. Yeah, but you just take the bottom pieces off so it looks like a hierarchy instead. All the bottoms of the triangle are deleted, so now it looks like a tree diagram. I think that's got a name, too. It's probably Serpinski's tree or something like mm-hmm. that. Um, it's named after a guy named Serpinski, as it turns out. But, and, yeah, and, and so you are correct with the totalitarian impulse. And, of course, this is also what what, what Marx says in his critique of, of Hegel's philosophy of the right. is you know This is a famous opium of the masses introduction. The religion is the sigh of the sigh of the oppressed creature. It's uh, it's the opium of the masses. And, but a couple paragraphs down, he says that religion is the false sun that man puts uh, so that he orbits around it until he realizes that he orbits around the true sun of himself. And mm. and so you can easily see how that breaks down the uh, entire hierarchy. You're not orienting yourself toward your family. You're not orienting orienting yourself toward your network of friends or your community you're not orienting yourself toward the city or you know broader community in which that's embedded you're not orienting that toward maybe the state or nation you're not orienting that toward uh and i was just thinking while you're talking about it it's a, something as you know somebody who's very active as atheist movement stuff a decade ago and look think back at how it used to bother me to see kind of state officials like give glory to god and now it's like no they're saying there's something higher than me that i have to be yeah, and I'm it's like, wait, that's really that's really comforting. <laughs> okay, it's not necessarily an endorsement of religion. It's a I'm not king of the universe mentality that's su- sort of important here that I'm kind of appreciating at the moment. And so what you see then is everybody's orienting toward themselves. And so what's going to happen is some megalomaniac is going to come in and be able to decide he's the true North Star with the right philosophy that's going to dictate what North stardom's, you know, it might not even be a star. It's probably the dirt and that we're all going to face. And so, you know, I think you are, I, I I really like your framing. I've got more, it's hard to respond to because it's kind of abstract in the moment, but I, I don't disagree with what you've put out uh, whatsoever. Yeah. But you can see how, like, that's why I'd use the word worship. It's attention. It's like, 
you were right when you talked about this idea of the North Star, but it's an embodied attention which which actually makes the world actually it's it's even more than what I said. It actually makes pretty much everything exist. It's like all things that have multiplicity are bound through something like a North Star in order for them to exist, even objects and things in the world. But that scales up into us. And then we exist together as beings because you're made of a bunch of stuff too. Like you're also made about, about of a bunch of, of multiplicity. But nonetheless, these, this multiplicity coalesces into one, but only to the extent that you also are bound to others in love and that that continues to build up. And that's that image that I said about the new, the new heavenly Jerusalem. Right. That's yeah, why yeah. there's this image of the kings render their crowns, their glory up into the new Jerusalem. That is that they all exist as kingdoms, but they are able to understand that there's something there's something transcend that transcends them. And they give that up and it keeps going up until it reaches, uh, you know, the until it reaches God, basically. So, yeah, this is um, this opens in the question is, well, so I think we're largely talking about the same thing in very different ways. And how what does it look like? in the 21st century where we are all connected by our phones, where our nations mean something because we live there physically and depend upon physical reality to survive in them. But at the same time, our nations that we identify with are primarily digital bands of of people who are in some sense like-minded, which transcends or crosses all borders. Um, And then we're kind of in this poisonous moment where literally folkish thought Folkish nationalist thought is being injected into identity categories, which has never worked out real well. You know, uh, it's almost like there's this attempt to hammer us into, oh, you're white, so you're black, so you're Hispanic, so uh, this, that, and the other thing in each case. And, you know, you should identify that. I even just saw a thing today somebody sent me. It was even when you speak about somebody else that you should, unless they've explicitly told you, opted out, you should put identity first. So I can't refer to, um, say, I I met with the Congressman Byron Donalds the other day. I talked to him. I can't say, yeah, I talked to Byron Donalds. I have to say, I talked to the black man, Byron Donalds. I have to put his identity first to recognize the importance of the identity. And so it's almost like I met with the Chinese national so-and-so. I met with the British so-and-so, you know, it's it, this folkish nationalism is being hammered on us in this kind of most disgusting way. So this is a challenge we're up we're up against. What does this fractal orientation, if we will, uh, this kind of fractal hierarchy of worship look like in a world that is no longer that your community is necessarily the physical community that you're surrounded with by virtue of happen, happening to have been born or moved to a certain locale uh, and even with family, you know, you're born into your family, but you're you're living on your smartphone, which is connected to the world everywhere. Fun times with being married, yeah. <laughs> sitting on the opposite ends of the couch as we do, talking to our people yeah. in our phones, you know, well, barely I, I looking at each that, other. I, I think that the, the, the solution to that is reorienting of attention. And I think that it is, I mean, I'm not saying that, I mean, we're trying, and we're, this is something that we're trying to do here as well, which is, to reconnect to the to the to our feet that are on the ground, and so it's not that we're going to necessarily completely not use the phone or decry the phone, but you know you go to church. That's why I tell people on my channel at times I go to church, and what I mean by go to church is I mean physically go to places where people gather together. You no, know, I say the same thing. Real life is what happens when you get offline, and I've had this whole conversation yesterday about with with my friend John Wood Jr. I'm supposed to say. Uh, Black man, we have to identify. And so we were having a conversation yesterday, and uh, we were talking about the difference between Zoom calls and conferences and getting together in person and the difference in connection that it makes. And, the, and how I, a year and a half ago, when COVID finally let me go to my first conference, and I, I just thought, I sat there in the lobby of this hotel after I talked with several people who went, wandered off for other commitments at the conference, and I kind of got left with nothing to do for a minute. And I sat there and thought about it. It's like, you know, this is magic. Yeah, I feel closer to these people in a different way than I would if we would have spent all this time by Zoom, where I'm just going to push the red button on my screen in a minute, and we're all back in our own worlds. You know, we had to travel together, so there's a commitment to getting there. We came together. We're physically present with one another. If I start to drift, you can slap me on the side of the head or the shoulder or whatever, get my attention, tap me on the shoulder, arm around me. You know, so there are these attention-orienting things that bring that community together. So I agree, yeah, go to church. Uh, where church can be construed broadly or narrowly or both. Yeah. 
I mean, that's the way that we've been trying to do it. And also, also, I mean, basically, I don't know if you know Rod Dreher. Uh, he wrote, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So his his kind of Benedict option, and now his recent book has been a way of thinking. You know, the way we're setting things up here, and so like the parish, but the, it's the, the online world is useful. So I can tell you what's happening around me right now. So my my parish basically you have the situation where a bunch of people start going to an Orthodox church because they watch my videos online. Not just that, but partly that. So they end up in this parish, but then the people there want to have a more real community and more real encounter. And so we actually start working on that, creating alternative, even networks for food, alternative networks for, you know, and understand that we have to be in the same place. We have to get together and eat together and sing together and do these things physically and work towards basically creating alternative, uh, even alternative economic systems, like looking at the Mennonites as a, as a kind of example of what's possible in terms of creating alternative um, systems in every sphere of reality, because without that, we're fried, like we are. No, and, I totally and, agree. And it has to happen very pretty fast because I things agree. are going super fast. Yeah, we've got to anchor ourselves onto the analog. In fact, the the physical. Um, yeah. In addition to figuring out how to make use of the digital, while dealing with the fact that these things are dopamine pumps above almost anything else, yeah. and that the law of convenience dictates it's just easier, and therefore. You know, you you have to go through all that trouble to go to a conference. You have to get on a plane. You have to stay in a hotel. You have to pack your bag. You have to go through trouble to drive to the church or even to walk to the church and to be at the church. And there's other things you could be doing. And it's at a certain time if you get every, want people to get together. Turns out punctuality is not white supremacy culture. It's a thing that ha- re- is required for people to get together Just intentionally. To get together, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there's the messiness of saying something in front of someone that you don't get on Twitter, that you don't get on Facebook. You know, you, yeah. you say something standing in front of someone and then you see the way they look at you and you you get it, you know, you can sense. That's why you can understand why the online world creates such dysfunctional behavior because yeah, of course. usually the, the physical world is there to remind you that that joke was a little, was off key. Like that was too much, you know. That statement just just came out of nowhere. Right. You get Whereas it on by Twitter, the subtle. You just block them. <laughs> exactly. Like, you just and I rem- this was a thing for me. So this is a spiritual moment. I was in a conversation publicly one time where it turned out to get kind of contentious across, and I th- had the the urge. This was a like a red warning siren that went off in my head when I realized to block, that, to block them. I, I wish I could block this person, like and like push a button and they just dis- disappear. I can't hear from them anymore. And I was like, holy shit, I have left the path of wisdom. I have to come back. Um, you know, and so I agree with you completely about this. And I I also agree if we don't do this fairly quickly, we're fried because the architects of digital tyranny are, are well ahead of, uh, where people think they might be. They've been seeing these opportunities and gaming for them for a while. Yeah. That's what it feels like. I mean, it's it's like we're late to the game and understanding how this has, this has been building up towards, you know, like the relationship between digital currency, metaverse, digital identity, all these things, all of a sudden these puzzles that are appearing in front of us. And you think, well, for these puzzle, for these puzzle pieces to appear so close to each other at this moment, it's not like this hasn't been going on for a while. Like these these pieces have been put into place for a while. So like you said, there's a we have we we have a we have a disadvantage at the moment in terms of uh, we need to, to catch up to, to make sure that. We're not completely swallowed.